We've got Matt Rasmussen who's going to talk to us about Docker and Python this evening. Thanks for everybody for coming out. Uh, so we're talking about Docker, Python, and you. Hopefully, um, by the end of the time, you'll have something that you can kind of apply to wherever you're at in Python development. Because a lot of times, Docker gets attributed to people in stuff like, uh, well, basically, basically web applications is the primary place I hear about it. Um, but there's some kind of cool ideas uh, coming out uh, where you can use Docker in some different ways for, say, you're a data scientist or uh, any type of scientist. Any, um, not a web dev, like a lot of us probably are. So my name is Matt Rasband. I work at Next Year Capital up in Carmel, um, primarily in Java and Spring stuff, but Python's still my first love and the thing I usually use if I can. So yeah, so tonight, happy 2017. I think Callan already covered that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're gonna kind of talk about the basic problems in computing that we've been trying to solve for a long time and why Docker came onto the scene and kind of what led up to the evolution of using Docker in a lot of places. Uh, at my work, we use it for pretty much every deployed application now. We actually just tried using a Windows, the Windows.NET Core one for one team. Um, so it is production ready. You can use it for large deployments, um, even though there's a lot of things that kind of comment. Uh, there's, there's some people that kind of hate on it, but. I want you to decide for yourself. I'm not going to say if you're not using Docker, you're doing anything wrong, but tell you a little bit about how you could use it. So the common problems in computing, I can't really read that down here. So uh, basically it comes down to application isolation. The big deal is um, when you have, a, when you're deploying an application, whatever it is, web dev or, or scientific application, uh, it's hard to know the state of the computer you're deploying to. So um, yeah, we're, over time we've evolved a, a couple stages to try to solve that, and we'll see those in a minute. Um, so basically everything comes down to that. Uh, dependable configuration, when you have servers, you, they get all over the place, but we'll get deeper into these. So the evolution of a server, the, what, the steps that got to Docker, and this is kind of overgeneralizing a couple different pieces, um, but um, don't want to get too much in the weeds of some of these. So you started off with bare metal. You have one server, and you probably deploy a ton of applications to it, um, whether that's with like Tomcat for Java, or uh, I don't think there's Python containers for that, uh, that kind of stuff. Then you came with virtualization, which is a bunch of operating systems on one host. So you take that bare metal server, you throw 10 different ones, 10 different other OSs on it, uh, trying to mitigate those, those differences. Um, and then came LXC containers, which is kind of what Docker's built on, and this, this isolates applications and the processes to different pieces of the operating system, so they can't uh, see as much of the host operating system, but it's not using a full OS or kernel on top of it. Uh, and then, then comes Docker, which is kind of just a nice abstraction on LXC. And I, they may have deviated more from that now. Um, so how many people here have used Docker in some capacity? And do you run uh, production systems on it, or? Play, okay, cool. Well, so hopefully they can correct me if I make some, some, uh, some lies about Docker here. <laughs> so first with bare metal, you kind of had a lot of issues. Um, hardware is an immediate concern with bare metal. You, you're, the device drivers, if you're running an NVIDIA versus a, uh, AMD card, they might be different. Um, so every time you deploy an application, you're think, you might be deploying to something different. And if it's in someone else's data center, the cloud, if you're running on bare metal, it's kind of hard to really know um, what that might do to your, your application. Um, and then a big thing coming from the web dev side is elasticity, so slow to replicate. That just means if I get a spike in traffic, can I throw up another server? Well, if it's bare metal, probably not. <laughs> um, and then obviously processes have mostly unrestricted views of the OS. You have users and groups, but those only mitigate so much. Um, and you really can't share it. So virtualization, which is the next phase, uh, it's resource intensive. So you have, why are you popping up right now? Sorry. Uh, you, let me turn on, do not disturb, sorry. <laughs> so you've got a bunch of OSs cloned, right? So this is really expensive. If you have 16 gigs of RAM uh, and you need four per OS and your apps need a bunch, like you're, you're sapping it all up, mostly in the virtualization layer. So the, OS, the separated OS to start chewing away at that uh, content. So it ends up just being a microcosm of metal. They're still hard to configure. They're still kind of hard to share. You got stuff like Vagrant to, to help with that in VMware. 
uh, and the file system can get really muddied up. There's no good way to get back to zero uh, unless you redeploy a full new one. So LXC is the isolation, so it's a lot, it, things are jailed off, they're harder to see the, the OS. Um, but they're not super portable in the raw, they're kind of hard to use a little bit if, I, uh, I've been using Linux for a long time and I don't really use them because I want to just get stuff done. Uh, but they're not versioned as far as I'm aware, there's no good way to keep them versioned. So coming back to the Python side of this, we can think about it in Python terms. First off, you start off with system Python. We can equate that to the OS. So if every application you deploy to the same server or to a server or your computer even, um, you are installing dependencies against your host site packages, which is where Python installs third-party libraries. So if um, I install something that requires requests 2.11 and one that requires 2.13, but I could have around a bug in 2.11, I can't have both on my system. Python didn't really write their dependencies in a way where I can uh, have those in two nested folders necessarily or something like that. Node has the same problem. Um, same with Go and a lot of other, other languages. Uh, and then equating it to virtualization, we have a bunch of interpreters. We just copy that same interpreter with the same configuration five times because I have five apps. I can keep my, my dependencies isolated per interpreter I use, but um, it's, it's kind of heavy weighted because uh, I have to copy all these things a bunch of times. And then we think of virtual environments, which we can kind of equate to LXE, Docker. Uh, the way virtual environments are actually implemented is a hybrid of, uh, of this one and the previous one. It's actually copies of Python, but sim links to the standard library, stuff like that. Um, but this, this can kind of shrink it down. You're no longer polluting different namespaces with your dependencies. <clears throat> so Docker, 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 Docker. Docker. This is, it's a buzzword, and it's hard to filter, I find, through buzzwords to figure out, is this something valuable to me as I'm working um, on my computer, when I deploy? There's all sorts of questions with it, in, in my opinion, and um, I don't know about a lot of you, but uh, a lot of times I just want to get stuff done, so it's hard to research a lot of these other things coming out and see if I can leverage them, how best to leverage them, uh, learn to use them well. So tonight we'll hopefully step through, not hopefully, we will be stepping through some pieces of that. So, just as another visualization, this is from the Docker website about what is Docker. So, when I talk about it's a lot less heavyweight, I really mean it's a lot less heavyweight. Oh, I found this cool new feature. I don't know if you guys have seen this. Come on. Got a laser pointer. <laughs> so, the guest OS is a virtual machine in many cases. So a lot of, I mean, a lot of people still deploy to this, and, and frankly, we do too. But we have Docker inside that, which doesn't make a lot of sense to, to me, but I'm a, uh, on DevOps. Um, so this is, you have copies of this. It's pretty heavyweight. Whereas with Docker, you have this Docker engine portion, um, and that, that, ah, sorry. Uh, and that is just, um, it's just a really lightweight way to share the containers. It kind of it provides some guarantees that you can run the same built container, and we'll get into what containers are, so sorry for some of the jargon, um, on any other system that also has Docker Engine. So if Windows has it, if Mac has it, if a Linux server has it, it should run pretty much the same. Uh, so far, I've seen that to be true. Uh, I've, I've found that to be true. Um, I know some people have not found that to be true, so there's, there's, I'm sure there's some caveats to this. Um, so, going back to like the benefit portion of this, uh, it's like LXC, but greater. It has some abstraction on top, it's lightweight, the networking is isolated, so it creates virtual network overlays over the operating system. Uh, the file system is copy, or copy on write, so you can't muddy it up, or if you do, you can kill the container, or the image container, restart it, and you have a fresh clean one, we'll see that. Um, it's versioned, so you have layers that are versioned and you can see what people have done to them. It's declarative, so you have a, a, a build file that defines how your image comes out. It's shareable, so I can package an app, send it to any of you, and you can run it. Uh, and there's tons of tooling around it. I love that sound. I don't know if anyone else does. <laughs> so boiled down, the whole point of Docker is try to make it easier for any of us to try to ship applications build them dependably, have other people be able to build them themselves, and uh, get away from, <laughs> uh, get away from the, the problems of trying to share an application. How many times have you said 
it works on my machine to somebody else. I, I've said it probably 500 times. Um, so this tries to get away from that problem. So as an example of what Docker can do, and we'll see how we can, can leverage this in a few minutes, um, I'm thinking through a build pipeline, for example, and I, I've seen this in a couple companies, and it kind of scares me because I'll ask you what the issues are with this in a second. Um, so in CI, we're going to clone the repo. We're going to install our requirements, or I guess activate a virtual environment. We're going to install our requirements, and we're going to run tests on it. And then I've seen people who take this, and they're like, cool, my code is good now. Let's deploy it to the developer, d uh, development environment. And they do effectively the same thing. And if the tests pass, or their uh, end-to-ends, or smoke tests pass, they do it a third time. Can anybody tell me what, what is likely problematic with this? No? Yeah, three potentially different environments. So depending on how you do your, your requirements file, and even then, you might actually get different versions in each of these. So what you're shipping may not be the code you've actually tested. Because if you're using Django under the covers, or Flask, or some third-party library, or some internal other library, there's a chance you got a slightly different bit-for-bit -bit copy than you did previously. So when you do something like this, which it works for a lot of companies, and they've written tooling around it to handle it, but it's potentially very problematic for you um, because you might be shipping code you technically didn't actually test. You're just checking like, your logic versus the dependency at the time. So if you do this with something like Docker or a Debian file or a PEX format, if you guys have seen that from Twitter, you do something kind of similar. You build it once. And it gives me this container, this image. So the, the terminology with Docker, there's an image, which is the definition of, it, it, it's like a class versus an instance. It's um, a definition of what could be a running machine. Um, but a container is what's actually running, actively running. When you kill it, it's, it's gone. So with this, we can build our app once. And we can deploy it to dev. So while I'm sending it to another environment, which might have some configuration mismatches, Docker protects you from the external environment, and it only gives you what you have passed in internally. So here, I've passed nothing, which is kind of a, a bad thing in some regards, but we'll, we'll see that in a minute. Um, but there's, I'm protected from the outside. Networking is isolated. If I didn't expose the port, which is the dash P flag, uh, it wouldn't even be mounted on the host operating system. So we deploy it to prod, and again, I am running the same code I tested, and then I smoke tested, and now I've deployed to prod, so hopefully my customers or my friends or whatever don't see weird regressions that couldn't have shown up that I, just by installing again. So we're gonna do live walkthroughs, because I want this to be something where you can walk away understanding it, because when I first saw Docker and read all the material, it all made giant leaps that I couldn't follow, because I couldn't picture it in my code. How does this work? So if this goes wrong, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to hope it doesn't. All right. Is that big enough, a little bit bigger? More? There? All right. So we're going to run something pre-made from somebody else. This is the simplest way to get started. So you, docker run is like the core command. It's the one you'll probably use the majority of the time if you decide to try out docker more. Um, so what, what the RM and the IT do are just, there are a couple flags that the IT keeps it open, so it's effectively a remote shell on another computer or on the container. The RM removes it at the end, so I don't have to clean up after myself. Docker is really bad about cleaning up after itself. Um, one of my friends has like 40 or 50 gigs of just stuff that's hard to get rid of because something in Docker depends on it. So we're in Python 3.6, which isn't, um, uh, which is the one in the container. We're now running off, off of my computer, so this is the same one. So when the beta was out, for example, the RC, 
This is how I was running it to test a couple apps against the next version, try async iterator, some of the new fun features of, of 3.6. If you haven't seen them, if you're not on 3, you should definitely try getting on 3. It's awesome. There's some awesome stuff. Um, I guess instead of, so when you launch a container, there's what's called the default command. And when we build our own image a little bit later, uh, we'll, I'll show you what this means. So you can override it usually with um, another argument, which it gets passed to the, to the shell. So you name dash r, so that's, well, that one's tiny. So that's the, the, the Docker image, and this is my computer, just to show they're different. Um, so anyway, there's a couple, oh yeah, I was gonna do that just to be silly. So to show that this is isolated though, so we've got our bin directory here, and I don't know how many times you've seen don't do this. Oh, ah. So ls is broken, cat is broken. Can't do anything on this container. But if I ship this to somebody and my application was in it, they could kill it, restart it, bins back. You're protected to some extent. Just <laughs> if you play with that, be careful. Um, <laughs> generally, don't do that. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Uh, good question. Uh, you should definitely use the dash dash no preserve root flag if you use that. <laughs> so we can build our own. And this is actually the one that I built for us tonight. Um, and it doesn't use any of the helpers. There's a, a couple different image types. We're, not gonna get into that, um, but this is the simplest way to build an application. So the way the Docker file is structured is you have a from, which means I'm inheriting from some other container. Somebody else has built something I am going to extend. Um, you can pretend it's a class hierarchy or whatever you want, um, but basically it's who I'm extending. So we're using the official Python 3.6 image. Um, we're using a workdir, so a working directory app. We're gonna copy our requirements in, we're gonna install them, I'm gonna copy the rest of my app in, and I'll, say, I'll tell you why in just a minute here, why we do that, um, and then we're gonna run the app, which is, this is that default entry point, which is why when we run this, it's Python. So this one's saying it's Python, my app. <clears throat> so, uh, I had a couple tips on this one too. Sorry, I lost my speaker notes. They're down on the bottom there, so you can just creep ahead if you want. Um, but basically, oh, that's not even in there. So the one tip I have, if you're using somebody else's image, definitely think about inspecting it or using an official one from Docker because you are technically taking somebody else's operating system and running it. They could have something under the covers that might do something to you. So I would just generally, generally expect, because I, Maybe you have a trust problem, I don't know. Um, I don't trust random stuff from the internet all that often. So you have this introspection concept. So if we wanna see how this image was built, which in my opinion, this is something, so we work in financial services at Next Gear. We get audited and we have people asking questions about who did what, who made a system do what. Um, you can check what happened with, uh, with stuff like that and since it's, so you can see, you can't see everything directly, but you can see, you know, this is their default command. That's why it's running Python 3 when we start it. These are some of the layers they did when they built it. Um, and since I have this pulled down, um, you don't get to see the layers. Let me do this for you real quick. Uh, so the way it's constructed, as you can see, these are layers getting pulled down. So each of these is an incremental change on the previous file system, hence the copy and write nature. Uh, each line in this file is technically a separate layer, um, meaning that if I use two different apps that share from Python 3.6 and they all share the same work there, these two hashes will be the same between two projects. It's just a way to optimize how much resources you're storing and stuff like that. Um, but each one is incrementally built on top of the other, so you can inv invalidate caches and it rebuilds it. And generally, this is why it's so fast. If I do this, it's like, it's already done. So if you do the Docker run, it just falls in. I mean, it doesn't have to pull anything. <clears throat> 
So when you start thinking about this, how many of us write apps that just talk to themselves? Probably not tons. Uh, I mean, maybe one-off script, stuff like that. Um, but the whole point of Docker is to isolate your stuff and ship it with things that are it depends on and make it where anyone else can run it. So I don't have Postgres running on my computer, for example. Um, well, we'll just we'll, we'll stick to the script. So, I don't <laughs> so we're going to run just a Python embedded HTTP server in one of these, and it's linked. So if you noticed, I was running it on 8080, and I can't connect to it from my host, host machine because it's isolated. The network is isolated from me, from the internet, from anybody else. It's actually in... Uh, sorry, I'm gonna make this bigger again. It's actually defined in one of these. So host is my host machine, and it's actually on a separate network from, from us right now. But if we run, um, but we can link it to other, machine, uh, other ones. And this is, as you can probably tell, this is kind of a pain. Let's see if I named it. Is it foobar? Yeah. So I can link it to a different machine. So it's isolated from my host machine, but I can actually access it from this one. So if you know how that server works, it just prints out the directory listing. So this isolation, though, is really helpful. Again, it, if you guys just saw the, I think there's an article the other day about MongoDB and how people are getting ransomed right now because their MongoDB deployments are exposed to the web and they didn't set up a password and they didn't do all the stuff you probably should do. Part of that was Mongo's fault because they didn't have sane defaults originally. Um, but now they have better ones, I guess. But this would isolate them from that. If they just expose it to the apps that actually need it, there's no way someone, well, <laughs> unlikely that somebody will be able to hack it. Yep, that kind of that. So manual linking stinks, as you can definitely see. So we'll go back to, I wrote a really silly app for us. Um, so it uses that Docker file that I, I, met, I showed in the slide. That is off the screen, isn't it? <laughs> 720 is hard to look at sometimes. Let's see. So we're just doing the same thing. And so getting back to that layering portion, let me make sure I removed what I had. Okay. So we can, the, the next kind of big thing other than running someone else's container is obviously building your own. Um, but we've inspected to make sure that the Python one isn't going to harm us, hopefully, um, is the build command. And you can just, it assembles one of these images for you. Um, so I'm going to name it uh, ndpy and tag it with latest. So it's kind of like a git tag if you want to think about it that way. So from the image, we're adding all the stuff on top. This is a silly little Flask app. I was hoping to have more time to build something cooler, get it on AWS and stuff to share. But my son got sick last weekend, so I lost a little bit of time. So again, Docker run, and I hope I did the standard Flask port. And, well, I forgot that I set up all that stuff. Um, <laughs> I tried to make it, uh, uh, yep, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, so, <laughs> funny story about using Python 3.6. <laughs> I actually had to back off the, the later one to use Docker, uh, Python 3.5 because it was an SSL. Uh, change, I think. I'm not sure. So you have to pass it explicit certs for certain things, and it was blowing up on me. Um, well, I had that one already, didn't I? So since I already had those things in the cache, you can see it's using this cache here. So it, it gets sped up. So I guess I can, I forgot to comment on this, but. Um, so each of these, the, the reason. The reason I do this uh, requirements text first before copying everything, because you could technically just copy everything, run the requirements. Um, 
yeah, I can't use Vim anymore apparently because I've been writing too much Java. Um, you could do this, but what happens is that invalidates these two layers, or this layer and this layer and this layer. So that means every time, even if I don't change an application dependency, it rebuilds everything, or so because a file probably changed or something. So you can kind of optimize some of your developer time um, by doing something like this. So if we install G Unicorn real quick, um, apparently I already have that. Yeah. So I've invalidated that cache. It has to rebuild everything different. That's that's kind of so this. It's just a way to optimize your time if you if you. Just set requirements so it only builds when something actually changes in your requirements file. So the point of manually linking stinks is I guess I'm gonna have to jump forward into the compose portion of this because um, I didn't test that this worked after I wrote a few more tags. I'm not gonna waste the time on that. Let's see. So this was I got a couple done on Sunday. Git tag. So we're going to jump forward to, does anyone know, does that annotate? Somebody know if you can list tags where they have the, the, the summary description by chance? I can't remember it. Okay. Excuse me just a moment, sorry. So we're going to call this, uh, I, think, I think I call it chatter without an E, trying to be kind of hip. Um, we'll just go straight to the last one and just show that. Um, naming, naming is hard, so. So getting back to the whole linking is a pain problem that I've uh, deviated us from a little bit. Um, Docker has something to help with that. Um, it's called Docker Compose. So you can kind of define your application and all of its dependencies and all their dependencies pretty declaratively, kind of like the Docker file. So nothing looks too different here in the Docker file. Well, to 3.5 because that SSL thing I mentioned. Um, but this Docker Compose file is kind of interesting. So what this app is, is, well, let's show you what it is and then we'll come back to show kind of how complex it is behind the scene. And if I wanted to share it with my QA folks or somebody else, it kind of kind of becomes uh, hard to do. Um, so you can see it creates a network, creates a volume, and volumes are just a way to make things not uh, eph ephemeral. Um, so if you have a database, for example, and you kill it and restart it in Docker, you lose all the data. But you can create volumes so you can kind of keep it between runs. And, versus risking that not working. I'm just gonna tell you that it, it, you know, that's the case. So this is kind of the normal stuff you'd see on CI, obviously. <clears throat> Running setups, all that stuff. So do you have to remember that you created that volume for fear that you forget you did in a subsequent run? Fortunately, no. They do default naming schemes for, but depending on your folder name, it names things in a certain way. So you can see, uh, remind me if I forget to get back to that when we look at the actual file, if that's okay. Um, so we started two instances of this app. Um, and so, hi, Anipai, Happy New Year again. Uh, I'm not a UI person, so I apologize, first off. So, uh, hi, hello, and when we refresh, we get the last couple of messages, and it supports. So I have it on 5000 and 5001, kind of to show, when you think about a distributed system, if I have just one socket server, and I have to go to a different socket server, or and I, I may not be connected to the other one, so there's a lot of complexity behind the scene that we're gonna dive into. So I got the previous messages from myself, um, Hello from 5001. So we're chatting back and forth. Um, I think we might have a competitor to Slack in case you guys want a business idea. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, it only supports Google Auth and um, yeah. 
I doubt it. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Uh, <laughs> so we're stopping these services. It spins them up and down for us. So um, if you have five different apps, like you don't have to remember what things have spin up and spin down. You don't have to configure a local Postgres instance or a local Redis instance or RabbitMQ. Basically everything I'm using for this app minus Redis. Um, so all that got linked for us. So a developer or DevOps or a QA person can find all the things they need to run at once um, like this and share it to another machine and it should, should work. Um, so there's a microphone, I don't wanna. Uh, <laughs> so you define your services and normally, I kinda did something you wouldn't normally do. You don't normally have two, oops, instances of the same one. Um, but I was conflicting on the port on the parent. But basically, to have a chat app, you need something to queue, to share messages between two instances. So for Slack, they probably have a thousand instances or whatever. Uh, but you can connect to any one and send messages, and it sends it to any other one, for example. So RabbitMQ is a perfect example of something that might do that. It's a queuing system that, um, that just distribute, it's distributed queues, so everybody can listen to the same message if they want and share it. So that's what is working under the covers. And then I'm using Postgres, um, but it's not running on my local machine, um, to, to store messages so I can uh, give them to the FBI or NSA or whoever. Um, just heads up. <laughs> but to, to encourage the persistence between runs, because locally I don't want to have to reset up all my data again and again and again. We have the volume construct, and since we define it here, Docker's default gives us naming for these things. So I don't have to even think about it now that there's this file. There's nothing I have to do other than know I run Docker Compose up. I could be running Java apps, Go apps in here, some language I don't know, Elixir or something, and I don't have to know any of the complexity because it can just happen in the Docker runtime where hopefully some other expert, one of you with like machine learning or something can tell me like, you just run it this way and you feed it data. That's all I need to know sometimes. So you can look at the naming if you really want. Um, with, by default it named it for me. We can set our own names. Um, but you can do the Docker, Docker volume if you look at the Docker command, there's a ton of things. You can mess with networks, you can mess with volumes, you can mess with images, all that stuff. So to answer the question earlier, I don't have to think about the name. I'm not gonna delete it, because if I, even if I try, watch, it lets me. Probably because I shut it down, it might. Yeah, so I can't even delete the volume without explicitly, without explicitly killing the services, which they're technically down. So Docker PS shows the process tree of, of processes. But we could shut it down, um, delete the volume, start it back up, and we won't get any of the previous messages from before. So you're protected from the NSA this time. So they're all gone. See what else I got in here. So sharing is caring. <laughs> Part of why we're all here, we wanna share knowledge and everything. So hopefully, let's see, if you want to build something, uh, I think I set up a repository for this. If you don't use virtual MV uh, wrapper, you definitely should, it makes your life a little easier. Um, So I'll install Flask real quick. Uh, so one thing, remember, that since the networking is isolated, you have to tell it the, the host to run on, and the port is the default. We'll just go with that. So let me go back versus typing this to that Docker file. So 
So uh, to get to the sharing is caring portion. We can Docker build, and since the whole point of the sharing portion, so my company has an internal Docker Hub registry or Docker Trusted Registry, I think is what it's called. Uh, and the point is you can keep every single version of your deployed server infinitely, I mean, assuming you have the storage space. So for example, we started a new distributed system and we're using Docker for it. So I actually have a record of every single version of an app I've deployed over time um, because of the sharing portion. So again, back to the auditing um, from the scientific portion, it might be um, uh, repeatability, trying to show things that actually um, work or the way the experiment has changed over time or something like that. So I made this Docker, Python, and you. And don't ask me why my name's Nerdwaller. I don't know. So tag it with uh, Jan 10. So you can see this is a new app. We're actually using an old cache because nothing's changed between we're still using Python 3.6 and the workdir, but everything else is different. So we're using Flask. <clears throat> Uh, and then we can do a grid push. Need to fix my shell. So we can actually share it here. And over time, keep track of how our app's changed, how it's evolved. But a big piece of this um, is keeping configuration, and this is part of my tips and tricks for how to use Docker properly keeping configuration as environmental variables. Don't hard code anything in a Docker container unless it can be static. Generally speaking, you want them to be as immutable as possible, so nothing changes other than what database do I talk to, stuff like that. So that this is pushed, if you guys want a Flask app that does nothing, you can pull this one. Um, so we can do So, uh, oh, it's main.py, isn't it? Yeah. So nothing changed other than the app itself, so it's real quick to build. And I broke it, oh, 500. Well, you get the idea. Uh, I typed 500 instead of 5,000 in the internal port, so sorry about that. So real world usage of web dev. What I wanted to do is I was gonna give you a different project to try to show a lot of these things in action. My son got sick, so I kind of ran out of time um, for the couple of days I had allotted. So the, the project here is something that I wanted to, to share with people, so if you are um, interested in Docker, you're not familiar with it, but you want to take a Flask or Django app from I'm not in Docker to I'm running fully in Docker, I set this up based on tags. So the first one didn't work because I didn't pass in the environment variables correctly um, in my command. But so basically it goes through the steps we mostly stepped through tonight. So it has just a basic app, no extra dependencies. Um, sorry, that's small. Uh, and just runs it in Docker. And then you can jump to the next tag and um, I'll look at the Docker file specific. Look at the releases. The releases is probably an easier view. So you can jump to the next, ta next tag and this one is now a simple chat system. So originally we had first tag, log in and log out with Google. No external dependencies. The app just lets you in and shows you something different. Simple chat system, but it doesn't work across two nodes. So if you launch two of them, um, and I'm talking to port 5000, and you guys are on 5001, we're never going to see messages together. Um, and this is intentional to make it a little bit more complex each time. So the next time actually adds in Rabbit Compose or in Rabbit MQ and the Compose portion and brings in that dependency. So now we could talk on infinite number of ports. Um, database to store your messages. So again, another, it's just an additive process. So I like, just so you can walk through it and hopefully not be too daunted uh, if you're new to it. And then I added the volume mapping so we don't lose our data each time. Um, 
So a couple tips with this, make sure you're listening on 0000, all network interfaces. So with G-Unicorn, if you use that um, for web dev, uh, dash dash bind 000 and then your port. Um, and then don't forget to map the port uh, to the host, that dash P flag here. This just says my host port 5000 to the containers port. Apparently I got an image stuck, what did, what did I do? <clears throat> so I missed the talk on machine learning. I heard it was excellent, but I was really hoping to find a way to demonstrate how you could share scientific experience with this, because a big piece of being scientific um, is repeatability and shareability and auditing and um, hopefully being able to extend on someone else's work at some point. Um, so as, as a, uh, a food for thought piece, I guess, I was just going to say, maybe consider trying to use Docker for that, that kind of thing. So you could um, load up your, on, in that Docker file, you could build a Postgres container that has your seed data in it that your models learn from. And then that way people don't have to worry about that syncing up process. Uh, if you have complex C dependencies, so um, last time I tried to run Python on Windows, I gave up in about 20 minutes because of the VC Varsol bat, if you guys have seen that error. Um, well, you could use the Anaconda. <laughs> yeah, it was something else to learn at the time, but I wasn't ready for it. So use Anaconda. Don't use Docker, use Anaconda. <laughs> um, yeah, so either way, I don't want it to depend on any of you running something different. If I have something complex to install, TensorFlow or... Um, uh, I can't think of any other examples. I'd rather you not have to deal with installing that. You can just run with an app or whatever. So tonight's Flask app is listed here. Um, it, there, I can put it on Twitter, wherever you guys prefer. Um, and I, another example here is this. I found this right before I came tonight. There's a, like a Docker curriculum for getting started by somebody. <sighs> It actually seemed pretty good. It tries to walk through kind of getting started. So it goes through the run command, goes through build, goes through Docker files, goes through compose um, in probably a better way than I can. And I think reading it, um, I'm a lot more visual than audio a lot of times. So um, reading it can sometimes help. But here's a wall of text that you're not supposed to, not supposed to do. So Docker doesn't clean up after itself. Uh, you probably want a lot of memory, well, oh, <laughs> storage space, I should say. There is a way to clean up a little bit. Um, there's something called, and it's in the notes, um, uh, Docker GC from Spotify. It, it'll go through and delete out unused stuff. Always use a tag for dependency. Don't use latest, because it's kind of like depending on the latest requests library. Might be, might be off by one. Um, Docker replaces the need for supervisor and circuits, so you generally only run one process per container ever because the Docker engine itself runs that for you. So if the container exits with a whatever status code and you, you tell it to always restart, it will. You don't need supervisor in there anymore. Uh, generally one process per container. You don't want, if you're running Celery, you don't want your app and Celery running in the same container. Just put it in two and add in a rabbit and call it a day. Um, make sure you're configuring with environmental variables, which um, I meant to show you with this. So this app is 100% responsive to environmental variables. So anything that should be configured can be through this. So you guys can sign your own um, cookies with keyboard kittens if you would like. Um, but kind of the normal stuff you'd see on your host machine, but in Docker, it's pretty much all it gets. So you're not going to get clutter of other stuff that it might grab, some weird configuration mismatches, stuff like that. It's declared, it's versioned, it's not going to fall off. Leverage the use, oh yeah, use volumes for persistent data. Um, unless you want to lose the data all the time, which is totally cool. Uh, <clears throat> use, use layers if you can. Um, it just saves you time. Um, Try to do something official for the images. So there's a big Python list if you want to run Python 3.6, Python 3.5. Um, 
It's, um, you can through Docker. So I, I try to not clutter up my host machine too much. So I, I literally have Python 3.6 for local scripting and the system default. Um, and for QA, the big thing that we've started doing is we use a compose file to mirror a production environment. So if we have a bug in production that's hard to find and we need QA to be able to re reproduce it, for example, we'll define a QA, a, a Docker compose that is production through and through other than the database it talks to. So it kind of simplifies a lot of that. Uh, and use a Docker ignore, which means it's kind of like a git ignore. It won't copy stuff into your image, so you're not going <clears> to... <throat> Um, get a bunch of bloat in there. So that's all I had. I had a couple days set aside, but like I said, my son got sick, so um, I'm definitely open for questions, anything like that. I figured I'd give you a couple non-tech picks, so if you didn't learn anything about Docker, maybe you like one of these things. Um, if you don't like these things, uh, you can uh, heckle me on Twitter, or email, whatever you want. Uh, I started watching The Path on Hulu, kind of interesting show. Um, it's about like a, a religious sect, and a guy is questioning, and I come from a religious background, so it's kind of interesting to see that story through another lens. Uh, and two bands I like, Minus the Bear and Bella Fig Figura, was, I, was an artist that was in that show and sounded kind of good. So thank you for coming. Um, that's the repo if it's something helpful. If it's not, let me know if there's something wrong with it. I'm happy to help you fix it. Um, and I'm new to a lot of this stuff, so feedback is always welcome. I want to improve. If I went too fast, if I went too slow, glossed over stuff, please give me feedback. And I think that's all I've got. All right, anybody got any questions? <laughs> all right, has anyone got any questions for Matt? I do, but no one else does. So you mentioned running one process per Docker. Do you run into any kind of performance hit with the overhead of the Docker containers themselves? And have you done this in production to any scale? Um, <clears throat> we, so <laughs> most of our stuff is Java-based apps in Docker. So there is performance hits for us because normally you can share a JVM across a bunch of apps. Um, but for us, we have a bunch of independent ones. So that has slowed it down. As far as for like, Python apps, I've not noticed anything. I've not benchmarked it side by side, but um, that's a good thought. I should probably benchmark them side by side. I haven't seen anything big, though. Cool. Anyone else got any questions? Here we go. Anthony. Yeah, uh, so I believe the question was, um, how can it help with legacy applications versus newer applications and across uh, different Python versions, right? So the one thing that we, uh, if you guys have seen GitLab and you, uh, if you've used their CI tool, it actually can build things in um, specific containers. So it's kind of like Tox on crack. You're not going to um, dirty up your local file system doing this. So uh, what I've been trying to do is, um, so this is for like deployed environments and stuff, try to have the OS system, the parent system, have basically nothing on it other than Docker, and then deploy the Python 2.7 app within a container on it, and then the 3.0 container, or 3x container on it, um, and that way, you're not dependent on anything else, but it keeps you segregated. Is that? Yeah. To talk between the two? Yeah, so you could use the linking feature. Um, you, if you want to expose a port separate from, like, your, if, you're, if it's like REST APIs or something, you could define a different port that it listens to um, and link those together, something like that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think uh, we've edited anything. So um, either Python or Java, we've not edited anything to run specific in Docker. Uh, we just make sure the couple couple rules of respond to configuration change, so environmental variables. Um, otherwise, it runs the same on my laptop as I as I can deploy it. So nothing else changes. All right, one more quick question. You only got another question? So desktop application. Is that, is that out of the question? Uh, if you want your customers to have Docker installed, is that an okay requirement? Yeah, so I would say it definitely could make sense, but it'd be like a web app. It's or you would have all your logic in that and then talk to it from like Electron or something. So you could do it. <laughs> Everything is possible. Yeah. So everyone, give uh, Matt a big round of applause. Thanks.